Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Neeti Goyal from Indira Gandhi National College, District Kurukshetra. Today, we are going to discuss about a module, Contemporary Applied Perspectives in Management under the paper, Principles and Practices of Management. Learning Outcome. After completing this module, the students will be able to understand the need for contemporary management techniques and the contemporary management techniques by various management thinkers. The contemporary organization faces unprecedented environmental and technological changes. Thus, one of the biggest challenges for the organizations is to continuously change the ways organizations are managed to meet the demands of this turbulent competitive environment. The Precursors of the Management Theory The concept of management is not new. It has been practiced for ages. There has been evidence of management as early as 3000 BC by the Sumerian civilization. They used written rules and regulations for governance. During that period, the mammoth structure in form of pyramids were constructed by the Egyptians. A human effort of such a massive scale is not possible without applying the principles of management. During that time, there is a lot of written evidence of set of rules for governance and practice and policies practiced by the Babylonians, Greeks, and also the Romans. In Asia, Chinese used extensive organizational structures for government agencies and arts. Early forms of organizational structures were seen in 500 AD when the Venetians used organizational design and planning concepts to control the seas. Hence, the principles of management have been used in one form or another by the civilizations from ancient times. Time has changed today. Many relevant things of the past have become redundant for today. Present times have characteristics which were never present before. There has been a total transformation in the ways businesses used to be. The environment in which the business operates has undergone a sea change necessitating the change in the organizations as well. Coming from a closely held structure of an organization, today's organizations are borderless, spanning across nations. The goods, services, personal, information and above all the ideas move freely across the nations. The leaders of the yesteryears are no longer guiding the destiny of the nations and the mighty organizations of the last few decades are no longer seen. The ideas of doing business are undergoing a tremendous change. The classical concepts of management put forth by the early stalwarts F. W. Taylor and Henry Fiol in the early 20th century. The behavior school became popular in 1930s and after the famous Hawthorne experiments. Then came the quantitative schools and the systems approach and contingency approach. After that, the modern concepts came to the preview. Industrial revolution, as well as the growth of factories and mass production, created a need for strong management process. Better and more efficient ways of manufacturing goods were needed in order to maximize productivity, bring down costs, and increase profitability. Since the late, late 1800s, Theorists have developed a wide range of methods for improving management practices. Unprecedented changes in the global scenario were seen in 1980s, such as emergence of free market regime, globalization, strengthening of the global bodies such as GATT and then WTO, and developments in information technology, which have rewritten the rules of management and organizational design completely. Accordingly, several new thoughts, new schools of thoughts have emerged in the recent times. These are Theory Z by William Auchi, 
Learning Organization by Peter F. Sench, Knowledge Worker by Coe, Competitive Strategy by Michael E. Porter, John Cotter's Change Management, Management Innovation by Gary Himmel, Core Competence by C.K. Prahlad and Gary Himmel, and Strategic Intent by Gary Himmel. William Auchi's Theory Z is the first theory contemporary management approach which we are discussing here. Theory Z was developed by Professor William Auchi after making a comparative study of Japanese and American management practices. Theory Z is an integrated model of motivation which combines the best features of Japanese and American management styles. Theory Z suggests a kind of give and take relationship between the organization and the employees. Learning Organization The concept of learning organization was given by Peter F. Sench, a professor of management at MIT, in his famous book, The Fifth Discipline. Peter Sench is one of the best known experts on learning organizations. The learning organization is an organization which aims at using the knowledge and skills of all within the organization through facilitating learning of its members and thus continuously transforming itself. Sench identified that organizations need to maintain knowledge about new products and processes, understand what is happening in the outside environment and produce creative solutions using the knowledge and skills of all within the organization. It involves all employees in identifying and solving problems, which allows the organization to continuously increase its ability to grow, learn, and achieve its purpose. Learning organizations remain competitive and proactive towards environmental changes and can facilitate change within the organizations easily. Learning organization increase the employee commitment to the organization. It is knowledge which enables an organization to create competitive advantage. This requires cooperation between individuals and groups, free and reliable communication, and a culture of trust. Characteristics of learning organization according to Senge are Systems thinking Learning organization view organization as a system. The performance of learning organization is measured as a whole and as well as of its various subsystems. Personal mastery. It relates to the commitment of workforce individually to the process of learning. If workforce is competitive, and is able to learn quickly, not only through formal systems of learning, but also through self-improvement, it will provide advantage to the organization. Third characteristic of learning organization are the mental models. Mental models are the beliefs and assumptions held by the individuals and organization. There is a difference between what an individual assumes in his mind and what he actually gets. And also, organizations also demand certain behavior and values from employees. Learning organizations promote open culture which promotes inquiry and trust which increase the employee commitment to the organization. The fourth characteristic is shared vision. There should be a common vision in the organization communicated to all which provides direction to learning. The fifth characteristic of learning organization is team learning. Learning organizations promote open communication when individual engaged in the process of learning interacts and engage into discussion with others, knowledge is shared and multiplied and thus facilitates quick growth of individual and organization. It improves the problem-solving capacity, knowledge and expertise. 
This accumulation of individual learning constitutes team learning. Learning cannot be forced upon an individual who is not receptive to learning. So, it is important to develop a learning culture within an organization. Thus, learning organization manages the organization through increasing learning and knowledge. Knowledge Worker by Covey Covey, the famous Harvard professor, gave the concept of knowledge worker in his famous book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. A knowledge worker is one who develops or uses knowledge. He advocated that knowledge workers should be identified and such a kind of environment should be created within an organization that the efficiency of knowledge workers could be explored to the maximum. Knowledge workers are the source of new ideas and help a firm to gain competitive advantage. New products, new designs, new models are the result of knowledge work. Success of an organization in this competitive era depends on how their knowledge is explored to the maximum. For this, it is important that an organization should be able to identify them and such workers should be given such an environment where their productivity could be enhanced. Organizations should recognize the different needs and motivations of the knowledge workers. A knowledge worker should be provided with the organizational facilities and state-of-the-art technology so that he need not wander in search of facilities, wasting his energy in search for them. A knowledge worker should be given autonomy to work. He should not be closely supervised, which could hinder his creativity. If a knowledge worker is provided the job according to his interest, he only needs to be told why of the situation and he can provide with the best solution to the problems. It is enough to tell a knowledge worker that what is desired of him. For example, if the product design is not appropriate, a knowledge worker just needs to be told that the design is not good because it is too sleek to handle. They will themselves offer the best solution. Assign knowledge worker the project according to his interest. Each knowledge worker is a unique asset to the organization. To get the best performance, it is important that their abilities are recognized and the ways in which those abilities could be explored to the maximum should be found. The concept of knowledge worker challenges the traditional principle of equity in the sense that it advocates that each knowledge worker should be treated as a unique asset and should be provided the best facilities and environment which he desires so that his potential could be utilized to the maximum for the benefit of the organization. Michael E. Porter's Competitive Strategy Michael E. Porter's work on competitiveness and competitive strategy is one of the famous work which has been successfully adopted by the firms. Porter has given a simplified model to analyze the competitive position of a firm and also its future prospects. Porter's five forces model can be used as a good analytical model along with other models such as SWOT and best analysis tools. According to Porter, the five forces that derive competition are supplier's power, buyer's power, competitive rivalry, threat of substitute products, and threat of new entry. Supplier power. The power of supplier depends on the uniqueness of their product and the number of such suppliers. The more unique product they supply, the more powerful they become and less is the bargaining power of firm and thus less powerful the firm is. Buyer power. The power of buyers depends 
on the number of buyers and the availability of substitutes. The more unique your product is, the less is the power of buyer and stronger is the firm. Competitive rivalry. The greater the number and strength of competitors, the less powerful firm becomes. Threat of substitute products, including technology change. If there is a substitute to the organization's product, the less powerful it becomes. The more are the number of substitutes, the less powerful the firm is. Threat of new entry. If the entry to the industry is difficult, the company enjoys more freedom and power. The difficulty to entry could be because of huge investment, barriers to entry, economies of scale, patents, etc., which makes it difficult to the competitors to enter into the market. Thus, by analyzing these forces, the firm can gain competitive advantage and can become proactive in its approach. Cotter's Change Management There is a true st saying, only change is static. However, human minds always resist change. It is not easy to incorporate any minor change in any set pattern for which one has become habitual. However, change needs to happen. However, if it is managed properly, it can be inculcated easily. With proper foundation, implementing change can be much easier. It is a slow process and stepwise. John Cotter, a professor at Harvard Business School, introduced eight-step change process in his 1995 book, Leading Change. The eight steps for leading change are as follows. The eight steps for leading change are as below. First, create urgency. As a first step, Cotter advocated that manager should convince the employees in the organization that change is required urgently. This helps in initial motivation. The employees should get to know that change is required to get and the reasons why it is required so that they can wholeheartedly think and prepare themselves about it. If the managers get successful at this, the next steps get easy. The second step is form a powerful coalition. Change is not one man's job. For this, team building is required. As a next step, team should be formed of those people who can play an active role in facilitating change. Such team members can be identified randomly from the whole organization. No line of hierarchy need to be followed to identify such managers. Rather, all those influential people who can help manage change should come up, work as team and further build the urgency for change. The third step is create a vision for change. Developing a vision is important as it provides common direction to the efforts. Vision tells where we want to go. It provides clarity of the objectives. Various ideas are given a concrete shape at this step. A clear vision can help everyone understand what is required. It helps in developing a clear strategy. Fourth step is communicate the vision. Communicating vision is as important as developing a vision. Vision should be communicated frequently and powerfully to everyone in the organization. It should be kept fresh in everyone's mind. Fifth step is to remove obstacles. Change also brings fears in the mind of people. Many questions crop up in minds regarding what change the change is going to bring for them. So it is important to address the concern openly and honestly so that change can be implemented wholeheartedly. Sixth step is to create short-term wins. For implementing change, motivation is required at every step. People feel motivated when some positive result emerges. Rather than a single long-term goal, short-term targets should be created. These short-term targets, when achieved, motivate the staff and will further motivate to achieve the next goals. All the negativities attached will subside with the achievement of these 
targets. Seventh step is to build on the change. Change is not short-term goal to be achieved. Even if things go smooth after preliminary implementation of the change process, the system should keep on improving so that long-term change is achieved. Each success provides an opportunity to build on what went right and identify what you can improve. The last step is anchor the changes in corporate culture. Change should become the part of the organization. Change vision must show in day-to-day -day work. One should make continuous efforts to ensure that the change is seen in every aspect of your organization. This will help give the change a solid place in the organization's culture. Management Innovation Gary Hamel, the faculty of the London Business School, pioneered the concept of management and innovation. Gary Hamel has been ranked as the world's most influential business thinker by the Wall Street Journal. And the Fortune magazine has called him the world's leading expert on business strategy. Hamel has worked as consultant for companies such as General Electric, Time Warner, Nestle, Shell, Best Buy, Procter & Gamble, 3M, IBM and Microsoft. He has given the concepts such as management innovation, strategic intent and core competence. His concepts have changed the practice of management in the companies around the world. As the name implies, management innovation is the innovation in management that is something different and new from the old traditional management processes and practices. Organizational innovation, intangibles management, etc. can be cited as management innovation. It is different from operational innovation as operational innovation is concerned with the innovation in the way business operations are carried out. For example, customer support, logistics, marketing, etc., but management innovation is the innovation in management principles, practices, and processes. Put simply, management innovation changes how managers do what they do. Basically, managers are involved in planning, motivating, coordinating, and controlling activities, accumulating and allocating resources, knowledge management, relationship management, etc. A management innovation should satisfy one or more of the following conditions. The innovation should be new and should challenge the orthodox management practices. It should affect the entire system and innovation should be continuous and progress in innovation should compound over time. Thus, management innovation is about innovating the management practices which can do wonders in improving the performance of organization. Core Competency by C.K. Prahalat and Gary Hemel the concept of core competency was introduced by celebrated management guru of Indian origin, Professor C.K. Prahalad and the world's most influential business thinker, Gary Hamel. Core competence is one of the most important business ideas currently being used all over the world. Core competency means identifying and concentrating on areas in which the firm is unique and outsourcing other activities as much as possible. It basically aims at realizing own strength and to build it up continuously. Building upon its strength will enable a firm to develop a unique level of expertise which will distinguish it from other firms and thus helps the firm to gain competitive advantage where it cannot be challenged by its competitors easily. It helps a firm in commanding a premium price as well. Thus, core competency is about focusing on the strengths and develop them as much as possible and to switch away from the areas of weakness and outsourcing the other activities. What? What is most important here is to identify the areas of core competence out of the areas where a company can do reasonably well. Hamel and Prahlad have given three tests to see whether they are true core competencies. One, first is core competency should be significantly relevant to the customer. Core competence is a unique feature on the basis of which a customer chooses the product or service. It is the USP that is the unique selling proposition of the product. If a customer do not buy a product on its USP, it is not core competence. For example, take the example of juicer mixers of company XYZ. They are brought because of their longer life. Difficult to imitate. 
the areas of core competence of a firm should be difficult to be imitated by the competitors so that competitive position could be sustained. Continuing with the above example, the technology which gives longer life to the juicers of XYZ company should be difficult to be imitated by other companies and it should provide potential access to a variety of markets. Core competency should provide access to a large number of potential markets. Opening of few small markets is not a core competency outcome. For example, if because of its long life feature of a juicer, a firm is able to increase its sales up to some extent, it will not be considered as an area of core competence. Thus, the presence of all the three characteristics together is necessary to identify a core competence area. If any of the above characteristics is missing, it is not core competence area. So most important in this concept is recognizing what is your core competence. Thus, concept of core competence is developing a concrete position in the areas of your unique strength that it becomes very difficult for the competitors to challenge you. Strategic intent. The concept of strategic intent was developed by Gary Hamel. Strategic intent aims at developing the desire to succeed among their employees. Usually, what firms do is that they make a SWOT analysis and try to do the best with the available resources within the business environment. But strategic intent works opposite. Rather than focusing on the resources, it aims at motivating the employees. It aims at enhancing their capabilities to exploit the opportunities and thus aims to achieve tremendous results. This has been practiced by many Japanese firms and as impossible results have been achieved. Strategic intent aims at fostering the desire to succeed among their employees and maintain it by spreading the vision of global leadership. Using this strategy, Canon lagged Xerox behind. There are many such other examples. The strategic intent notion helps managers focus on creating new capabilities to exploit future opportunities. Strategic intent is more internally focused. What is usually practiced is that we try to achieve the maximum out of the available resources. But strategic intent is like leveraging the resources by leveraging the potential of the employees by motivating them and try to attain goals which seem to be impossible. So students, let us summarize what we have learned in this module. We are on the verge of a rapidly changing economy and there is a lot more beyond legacy. The present times are characterized by change. Today is different from yesterday and tomorrow will be different from today. This change is very fast and is all encompassing. Organizations and individuals of tomorrow have to function within this change. What was seen as wrong is no longer seen so. The workforce and the leaders of tomorrow will be different and the rules of success are changing fast. The principles of management are changing fast. The earlier principle of division of work has been challenged in the present times by theory set as a manager is expected to know everything. While one has to be specialized in one job, people prefer a specialist with a generalist approach. There is no longer any centralization in the organization and the span of control is also undergoing a change. IT enabled networks and systems enable the seniors to monitor the activities of dozens of subordinates. The order of the yesterday is giving place to flexibility. The firms have flexi timings, flexi salaries and flexible methods of performance. The earlier principles of remuneration, initiative and equity are giving way to performance linked awards. Thus, with changing environment, management practices have also undergone sea change and traditional concepts are no longer the rule of thumb governing management. Thank you.